Welcome, I'm Bill Wake. We're here with a summary of the work we did on Twitch last week, working on the programming language called Tenth, and we're doing a compiler slash interpreter for uh, the Tenth language, which is similar to Fourth, and we're doing TDD with it, so it's a, it's a mixed bag of things. This was a full week. We finished compiling if statements, while statements, we developed variables and arrays, we started strings, We've got an eval so we can load a string, and then all we can do so far is print it, but we have a few functions in mind. Okay, let's look at an if statement, and we're trying to take the perspective of, uh, basically it's a compiler writer's perspective. So given a condition A with an if statement and then some code to execute followed by a fee, the backwards if, or an if with an else and then a fee, then we want to figure out what code we should generate in those two cases. And ideally, we can make those similar enough that we, um, the code we generate for the if doesn't really depend on the else, because that's an optional piece. So on an if statement, you first generate code to evaluate the condition A, and then we have to generate a jump if false to the end. So we're skipping around the code we want to execute if it's true. So if it's false, it jumps. If it's true, it executes the code inside if, which is compiled however that gets compiled. And then at the end, we have an end label and then whatever codes after the if statement. So if we have that jump if false early on, we don't know where the end label is going to be till the end. So the fee statement, when we see that, we go ahead and backfill where the end statement was. The if else fee is similar. So you evaluate A and you jump if false to some label, but the label you jump to is the else rather than the end if, the fee. Once you've done that jump, you do the code inside the if, and then you have a an unconditional jump, jump to the end. Okay, so the, the if block skips over the else block. Otherwise you have the else label followed by the code for the else, and then the end statement where you jump to at the end. So the two labels, the else label and the end label, um, have to be filled in at the right time with the right code. All right, and here's our code for if. So this generates, both those cases had jump if false. So we generate a load, um, a load address which loads that instruction in, and then we store it into our secondary, which is where we're writing the code that we're generating. So we've generated the jump if false. It's got to be followed by an address, okay? So we don't know that address yet because it's the the bottom of the if statement. So we're going to push this uh, address onto the control stack. So where do we want to back patch? Push that onto the control stack. And control stack is just a stack for control statements with, you know, labels and endpoints where they should go. Then we're going to generate a minus one in our secondary, which is just a placeholder. So we have jump if false minus one, and that minus one has to turn into a real address at some point. But uh, this code for if works for if or if then else. In both cases, it's got a, a place that has to be back patched, and whoever's going to handle that has to take care of that back patching. Next, we have the else, and else says, okay, I also have to generate a jump, not a, not a conditional jump, but an unconditional jump. And so it generates the jump, and then at that point, it pops whatever's on the control stack. Well, that was, the, um, that, was that minus one we just generated, and we want to point that, you know, um, just beyond here to where the else statement's going to be. So right after the jump, we know now where we should patch to, which is the current position. And so we um, we hold that in X0. Then we um, push the current location onto the secondary space because that's the, the, we need to know where to come from for that. We generate a placeholder address and for the, ju for the jump, and we store that on the, the um, store that in the secondary. Okay. And, at the end, we're going to store the address of the else body so we know where to patch. Okay, so it's um, it's a little dance to kind of hand around where things are, but we're um, in line 138. We're actually patching the the place we popped earlier. So this is how the uh, the conditional for the if ends up jumping to the else clause instead of the end if. And finally, the fee, the end statement. Well, all we have to worry about is there's something on the stack, and we're supposed to point that to here. So we uh, store the the value we pop, we store there the pointer to the current space. So this will be the code after the if statement. 
All right. So uh, if you've never looked at compiler stuff before, this is probably like, whoa, you know, but um, uh, the process you go through is pretty similar for most of these statements. You you take a statement in a high level language and then you translate it down to uh, a, a somewhat lower level language. But for us, typically including either jump if false or jump. And you kind of rearrange your things to, to match that structure. And then you identify points in the compilation where you can kind of make decisions about how to create the control points, you know, how to, how to handle the jump if false and so on. So those, those statements like if and fee, they control the, the code that corresponds to the control aspects of the statement. Okay, so we're going to try again with while statement. <laughs> okay, so if you say while expression do and then a body, and then an odd, OD is due backwards, um, you've um, got a while statement that's going to repeatedly check the expression and either execute the body or decide you're done with the loop. And then at the end of the loop, you go back to the beginning. Okay, and so this, in our in our sort of lower level code, this uh, turns into some more jump if falses and so on. So we see we have a start point where our while loop starts. That's where the odd is going to want to return to. Um, then the expression, well, however expressions get generated for code, we just make sure we've got an expression sitting there when we're done. Okay. And then uh, the do itself is going to be correspond to the jump if false. So if the expression's false, jump out of the loop. Otherwise, do the body of the loop and then jump back to the starting point of the loop. Okay. And then after the loop, you've got whatever code comes next. Hopefully that makes sense. I should mention fee and, do, and odd. Um, Algol, I think Algol 68 did this first, but just took the sort of reversed names for things. I didn't have a great choice. I didn't want to use braces for the kind of code we're generating. I thought we'd tip the hat to old Algol with that. They also had ESAC for case, but we we aren't doing a case today, so we're we're safe. All right, so the while and do statements. So remember, while was just a pointer to the top of the stack. We just had to keep track of that so we know where to jump to. So we'll push that on the control stack. And then um, eventually they'll they'll do uh, while, then expr. That gets compiled. Then we do the do. Do says, okay, I need to generate a jump if false. And then I don't know where to jump to yet. So I'll push that on the secondary stack, the uh, control stack, rather. And I'll push that minus one into this, you know, put a minus one in the secondary just as a placeholder so it takes up the room but doesn't doesn't have a valid address. So if you ever, for you made a mistake in your compiler, you'd have a minus one there that would give some sort of bus error or something when you tried to execute it. So it'll be, you know, a very primitive warning. All right, but uh, we've got the front of the loop done now. We, we have that jump if false. We need to get the body next. That's going to happen automatically. And then we hit the OD, the odd. And um, if you remember that one, it was a jump back to the top. Okay, well, the top is sitting on the stack. So we'll generate the jump itself. And then we've got to get X0 is the, um, the, end of the, the end point of the loop. X1 is the start of the loop. Okay, so we generate that start of the loop, X1 there. And then um, we need to patch the other one is um, x0. So x0 holds, where's that jump if false that gets us down to the bottom here? Well, we're going to store the current location, secondary space, you know, the next place we would write code to. We'll put that at the bottom, at the, sorry, at the top of the loop when it jumps if false, so it comes down here and exits. All right. So it's, um, again, you know, you can kind of work your way carefully through it. It's probably easier to start with while and then work your ba way back to if. But um, the thing that's going on that makes this work really to me is this control stack. So we we store addresses we're going to need to back patch as we go. And be, we'd use a stack because you might have an if inside a while, inside an if, inside a while, inside something else. Each of those needs to manage its sort of bookends. You know, this is this is kind of, well, it's kind of an advantage of structured programming in a way that you get this nested aspect of your code that a, a stack is the thing to match, excuse me, to match endpoints on things or to, you know, to match enclosed things, hierarchies of things. Uh, to me, even though this is assembly code, it's not hard to understand it to say what's going on in that context. So. Okay. Next, we had to work on variables. So in a way, this is interesting to me that this, this language we're doing 
we were able to develop basically the whole compiler and interpreter without any of these things. So it's a very incremental approach. Now, most of the way this language works, it's mostly stack based. We have a data stack. So, you know, three plus four is three, push three, push four, add, takes the top two and adds them and puts the result back on the stack. Most of your expressions don't really need variables given that. It takes a little tracing or head scratching to, to keep track of things, but uh, it works and it makes a lot more of local context than, than some languages do. So a variable is a declaration. Vari variable itself, the word variable, is going to be a meta word. It's, a, it's sort of a compiler sort of word. And what it's going to do is it needs to allocate space for this thing somewhere. So our approach is going to be turn this into a secondary. So it's as if it were a routine um, uh, composed of other things. Sometimes these get called passive secondaries because they're not really code, like our current secondaries are mostly addresses of place subroutines to call, if you want to look at it that way. And this is really a chunk of value. <laughs> okay. So at any rate, we're going to put it in a secondary. So secondaries have, well, they have a header. The header has a pointer to the previous entry in the, in the uh, dictionary. Then it's got the name of the routine so we can find it. And then it's got a routine it calls. So um, just like we had secondaries called start 2D, variables called load address. Then we we have the, those three components form a valid header for a routine. So our variable looks kind of like a routine. As far as anything else is concerned, accessing this variable runs a routine, and that's that's what it does. Okay, so, um, but we have to have the variable, the value, you know, the space for the value itself, and that's in number two there. Allocate the next word with a zero value. So, We've said variables will always have zero to start and with. This load address that we referenced, it's going to take the first word um, and load that to the data stack. So it's really getting the address of the variable is is how I would think of it. And so there are two, we, we just call them words usually, but um, the at word is kind of dealing with the pointer aspect of that. If you call a variable like name, well, immediately that runs load address. So the, the name gets looked up in the dictionary, it finds load address, it says, oh, I'm gonna run load address. And it runs that, and load address has that pointer to the second, you know, to the word number two there, and it gets the address of that variable. And so it's as if, if you've ever programmed C, it's like everything's a pointer in effect. And so uh, loading a variable is really loading the pointer to that variable. If you call at, that's kind of dereferencing the pointer. It takes that memory pointed to the variable and says, oh, take that pointer, get the contents of the thing it points to, and and put that on the stack instead of the pointer. Okay, so it's a it's kind of a, a, a way to get the value by dereferencing. And then the second word we added is at equals, and it's got two things on the stack. Um, a is the value you want to store, and then B is the variable you want to store it into. So you would say um, name seven add equals would say be the effect of name equals seven in some other programming language. Okay, and it, it works similarly. It pops that address B and says, okay, well, it pops A and then B, and then it looks at B and says, okay, that's an address. Let me take that value A and store it in that address. And so you get a pretty straightforward way to do this. It's a little expensive in the sense that you have to allocate a header as well as a variable, uh, excuse me, as well as the space for that value, but um, it fits into the rest of the framework in a nice way. All right, let's see the code for a variable. So we uh, first have standard prolog. It just sets up registers and pushes things in the stack the right way so we can return from our expressions or our functions. All right, so we're going to do read word and define word, okay, and um, that's, that's giving, you know, read word goes and reads whatever the current variable is. So we've, we had the, um, expression usage is there in the box is variable name. So we're in the variable routine. It's going to move forward and pull names. So it knows what name it's doing. And then it's going to do define word that creates the header for things. Okay. And, um, we'll fill in that header with, x0 is the load address, 
and then we'll store that into the secondary. So we're kind of populating the the code for the expression for the variable here. Um, store that one. Then we store a zero. Okay, so that's to initialize the variable. So define word took care of um, the pointer to the previous dictionary and the new word that we just read in. Those end up in the front of the header, and then we have the load address and the the contents coming after. So storing that zero, and that's that's all there is for this. There's just a header and a value zero, and there you are. Okay, and so once you have that, we have those operators at and assign. Um, at corresponds to at sign, and at assign corresponds to at equals. So uh, to to get the address of a variable, you pop you well you pop the variable's address because that's what's sitting there. You load the contents of the address. That's the that bracket x zero is the indirect operator, and then that gives us back the the contents, and then we push that back on the stack. So it's um, Variable addresses on the stack, dereference the pointer and push, you know, we've popped that, so replace it with the contents of the value. Very straightforward. Okay, now assign was a little more work, at least differently structured. You had two values on the stack. X1 is the value you want to assign, and X2 is the address of the variable to assign it to. So we pop those two off the stack and then do a store. We write the value of x1 into the address of x2, or address specified by x2, and that's our assignment. Okay, so um, a normal, I mean, if you were compiling C, you probably, you know, 61's kind of the heart of that. They maintain their variables differently, so you don't have to pop them off in quite the same way. They usually would get assigned to registers and then just be there. In this, the, the stack takes the place of the registers in effect. We end up using registers to manage the stack. All right, uh, next we tackled arrays, and they're a little different, but they're very similar to variables. So in effect, an array is um, not just one value, but a, a, you know, a chunk of values. We right now only have arrays of numbers. Um, we don't have any strings as of the day we were working on this. Okay, but to declare an array, you say size, how many words you want, then array is a meta word, and name, what's the name of this array you want? And so um, we got the size on the stack, we come in and say, okay, we need a header, it's got to have the dictionary pointer, it's got to have the name of the method, and it's got to have, in our case, load address, because that calculates array addresses, and then we're going to allocate words. And in our case, I decided all arrays would be initialized with zeros. And I think it'll just save us from some mistakes later on. You know, it's pretty easy to not initialize something. The cost of this, it's kind of a compile time cost, so I'm not not too worried about that. You create these, these arrays at compile time. All right, so load address, it's the same load address. It loads the first address, uh, the address of the first word to the data stack. So... It doesn't get you into the body of the array. It just gets you the, the start of the array. Then we have plus at, which is the array version of at. It's got the index on top and then the address of the array second down. So you say whatever the array name is and then three pop, that's going to get you the contents of array, well, sub four. It's zero base, so it's off by one. But it gets that with B plus A times A. So B is the base address, the uh, the address of the variable. And then our words are eight bytes long. So however, what your index is times eight gets you the byte number. All right, Pot, plus equals, plus at equals is similar. Instead of popping two things like we did for variables, we pop three. So uh, A is the value to store, B is the index, and then C is the base address of the array. And so we store A into whatever C plus eight times B points to. Okay. Not a tricky, not a tricky thing to do. It's a bare bone array. Let's look at the code. All right. So array, you say size, value on the stack, array, name. All right. So you come in and uh, we want to make a variable, the, basically the header built around name. Okay. So a uh, variable we just looked at takes care of the name, it reads it, and so on. Um, so this happens just kind of the same way. The, the header gets created just like for a variable. 
the first zero is already written there. Okay, so we, we trust all that to work because variable does it for us. And then we're gonna pop that size and figure out how many cells we really want. And given that, we have that loop from 75 to 80 that basically just allocates and um, stores zeros in, in the slots for each one based on the number of uh, cells that the size specified. And then once we exit out of the loop, we're done. We've basically created a block of zeros with the proper header. And uh, that's enough to make those operations work. All right, so here's array at instead of just plain old at. And you can see it's not much bigger. Okay, so uh, x1 gives us the index and x2 gives us the address of the array. And so we're gonna load x0, but now this is a little more complicated access. We wanted basically x2 plus x1 times eight. Well, this indirect says, you know, take x, take the first one, x2, and then take the second one and multiply it by the power of two that the LSL says and um, add them. Okay, so it's it's basically the, the access mode designed for simple array access. So our array is a power of two. We use eight byte um, cells. So X1 shifted left three is sort of, sort of the equivalent of X1 multiplied by eight, unless you have to worry about negatives and stuff, but we don't. Okay, and then um, add X1 shifted to X2 and you get the address and uh, we'll load whatever value is at that, cell, you know, whichever cell that is, and then push it onto the stack. Okay, now there's no mode that does everything, um, but uh, we, you know, we're splitting it into a couple instructions therefore. So it it is very similar to the simple assignment, or uh, sorry, the very simple or at operator. And, uh, you know, it's really just that, that extra multiply that and the extra value on the stack that makes that different. Okay, and then array assign, we pop the value, pop the index, pop the address, and then do a store. And again, the addressing mode gives us x3 plus x2 times eight in effect. And that's exactly what we want for the address of the cell. And we store the value in the cell. All right, and then uh, we looked at strings and we haven't finished them yet, but we've done a little bit. So the first thing we do is quote string quote. Um, if you're in execution mode, you just wanna do stuff. Do, do something. You don't want to, uh, you're not compiling anything at this point. You're just saying, push the string on the stack and then do something with it. Okay, so our strings are gonna be immutable. They're just allocated, you know, allocated into space with something pointing at them. The execution is trivial that we just create that space, create the string somewhere, push the address on the stack. So it's kind of like a variable. Um, and then we, we only implemented one routine so far, which is dot dollar. So normally for us, dot prints the top of the stack, the variable at the top of the stack. And instead, dot dollar prints the string pointed to by the value at the top of the stack. All right, let's take a look. So here's strings. And I thought I'd start with a test. So eval pushes a string address on the data stack. Test start, test end are macros that we use for our unit tests. So the arrange section, we're gonna initialize some things. So first the secondary space, that's where uh, values get compiled to and executed to. Then the dictionary init, well dictionary is what points to the secondary space to uh, find words when you wanna look them up. And then finally data stack init, the data stack, you know, we have this, this stack we're using uh, for runtime data expressions. And this basically just sets a variable to, to say where the stack is pointing to. Okay, with those in place then, we're gonna create x0 is uh, the string we want. So if the variable was named bar, then L string would point to, or x0 would end up pointing to an ASCII string that says bar. And then x1 is an extra return value we get that tells us what's the type of expression we have. So when we read a word, we now find out, is it a string? It starts with quotes, or is it a regular word? And a regular word is, um, well, it's a mix of just about anything, but anything that doesn't start with a quote. Now, in the longer run, I want to distinguish, are you a totally regular word or are you a, um, you know, a string of digits? Because we handle digits a little differently. We turn those into numbers. Wow. So, but we, 
we had some complicated options, but it seemed like the best one to return this pair that tells us the type and the contents. All right, and then, so once those are all set up, we've basically set up, how do you evaluate something? So we're gonna, we'll call eval. We've set things up to be a runtime evaluation, which is basically, you know, I just read a word and that word happens to be a string. Okay, eval, do your thing. All right, and we, we won't, we won't tackle the whole of eval. We'll look at the relevant piece in a minute. Okay, but we're going to call eval. And then when we get back something, well, I should be able to pop that value. The value is the address of the string that got pushed on the stack. That won't be L1, but the string it points to will be equal to the string that uh, L string is. Okay, so BL assert equal strings takes the string pointed to by X0, the string pointed to by X1, and compares them. That should tell us we've got the right value on the stack, and it, it works. Okay. All right, so eval is a moderately big routine, but uh, one piece of it, pretty early on, we compare x1 to string not uh, to string found. So we're deciding how do I, it's kind of like a, it's sort of a series of if statements, or you can think of it as a case statement kind of thing. But, you know, the first case is string is found. The second case is word is found, and so on. All right, so what do you do? You compare x1 the type value to string found. If it's not equal, we skip over this and go on and evaluate words and numbers, okay? If it is equal, we've got a string. All right, so we'll take the string address and store the string itself in, a, in the secondary space. The so, data push, that's the return value is the address that we're gonna put that string in. So it points to the current secondary space and then define string puts that string in there. And so define string is very careful that it it puts a string into secondary space. It updates that secondary space counter, but it makes sure at the end that it's aligned to an eight byte boundary. So if we're pushing a mix of strings and addresses and numbers and all that stuff, we really want everything aligned to eight byte boundaries. So define string takes care of that. At the end, you're, you've done the evaluation for this aspect, so jump to the end and get out of the eval statement. Uh, print string is, is very easy, dot print string, I should say. Uh, you've got a routine with a prolog because it calls other functions. You take the value at the top of the stack and you call, we've already got to find a method called print that prints a string pointed to by x0. So very minimal, you know, kind of thing. Um, notice we use data top and not data pop. We decided that print should be kind of a peak sort of function, not a not a computational one. So if you put values on the stack and print them, you can you can peek at them without destroying the stack you just created. So okay, so from here for strings, um, we have several more string operations in mind. We'll we'll tackle those next week. And so next week, well one thing is we have interpreting strings, so the runtime REPL kind of thing works. We haven't actually compiled strings yet. So that's going to be kind of a combination of what we did with uh, runtime strings and what we're doing with variables. So in effect, it's gonna be an array, except that the instead of a bunch of bytes defining integers, it's gonna be all those individual characters kind of packed in. Okay. So we'll get compilation working, and then we'll work on some string operations. All right, and then the other big thing, kind of the last piece for um, making a useful programming language, or at least more useful than this, than it is without it, we'd like to be able to read stuff. So read input a character at a time. The one last piece, I don't know if we're gonna to need to do what I wanna do next, but we may have to do it, is reading from a file. So more for our interpreter, I'd like to be able to read a file and kind of compile that code. But once it's done, we are gonna create some sort of application. It could be a small game, it could be a calculator, I don't know, but it's 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 that sort of size, not, not a, not a Vim kind of replacement or anything like that. All right. Well, thanks for listening to this summary. It was a big week. If you want to join us, it's Monday through Thursday, 2 to 4.30 Eastern time or 6 to 8.30 PM UTC. The easiest way is to go to xp123.com slash Twitch, and that'll get you to the live sessions. Or you can go to xp123.com slash YouTube, and you get the sessions that I've uh, edited lightly, and they're a couple or three weeks behind. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.